Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Kelvin here today, Prince of Positive, with a special guest today. Rather than you just listening to me, I have a special guest for you today, Miss Jamie Lerner. Jamie is a therapist, author, guide, coach, if you will, helping her students and clients live more happy and fulfilling and integrated lives via the teachings of Abraham Hicks. She has some valuable things to say and some perspectives you may want to embrace. I'm sure you'll enjoy the interview as much as I did, and I hope you find value in her insights and perspectives. Enjoy the show. Welcome to the Intensely Positive Podcast with your host, Kelvin P. Ringo. Reset your mindset to make every day count. And make positivity your way of life. Are you ready? Let's just do this. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Kelvin P. Ringo, Prince of Positive, calling you not live this time. Well, actually, I'm live on the phone now with a, an exceptional person that I'm sure that you're going to be really glad to hear from is Jamie Lerner, who is an integrative therapist, helps people learn how to have better love relationships and family relationships and relationships with themselves. As in her book, The Ever-Loving Essence of You, which teaches you how to have a love affair with yourself. Jamie, how are you today? Thank you so much for being on the show. I'm wonderful. Thank you for inviting me. You are absolutely welcome. And uh, I, I, I told you before, you know, there's so much in your book I'd really like to cover. But I think what we're going to do first is just kind of um, let everybody know a little bit about who you are. So why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about your journey and how you got here and do any things that you do for people? Okay. Well, um, I was born with a knowing, a true sense of who I came forth to become, which I believe we all are. And I grew up in this amazing family that really encouraged me and all of my brothers and sisters to explore every curiosity and embark on an incredible journey journey of self-discovery. And um, throughout um, all of my childhood, I really threw myself into the mix of being out there on the uh, rough and ragged edge. (laughs) Uh, I was ahead of my time and uh, way ahead of my time and um, never the popular girl, but always beat to my own drum and stayed very true to me. Mm -hmm. Um, And um, spent a half of my life really uh, wondering why I did not feel the same connection with my mother that I did to myself. So this was um, a, a very uh, perplexing question for me that it took me a very long time to explore and understand. Um, the book was written in love and appreciation for my mother, who, um, after I sat with for five days when she was in the ICU, mm-hmm. that was the time that I really felt the love so flow through her to me. And um, it was, I believe, her most connected state of being. So she was an amazing force of nature that sidestepped the most important relationship of all. And that was the relationship that she had with herself. And Mm -hmm. just it was then that I really understood that it was only because of her own um, disconnection from herself that I was unable to connect with her. So um, this is a very loving book. And um, it is. Uh, in her honor, because I could not have picked a better mother to remind me of my own connection with me. So that's where this book has uh, was born from. All right. Well, you, I, I saw you, and, and I was trying to place what exactly, um, uh, you, you know, being out there was for, for you. So, but I'll, I'll let that flow as a book comes. Now, you have you're you're a psychotherapist, yes. I am not. I am not any longer a psychotherapist. I did. I had a psychotherapy practice for many years, mm-hmm. and I never felt comfortable. I never felt like I was doing my clients um, 
a service by asking them to continually look back instead of moving forward. So I dissolved my practice and I traveled and I really immersed myself in the teachings of Abraham Hicks. And she is my mentor and my teacher and I live and breathe her work. And I um, started something which is the integrative approach to well-being, which is really helping people to, um, to decide what they're wanting, where they want to be where they want to go. Mm-hmm. And I believe that we can do that without looking back. So um, it's a very gentle, loving approach in helping reconnect people with themselves and um, so that they begin to trust themselves and understand that they are truly their own greatest resource. All right, it's a really I'm sorry. Fun, it's really fun too. It's, it's super fun. So we don't take any of this too seriously, I have to say. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, that ought to be a fun. <laughs> um, okay. So you, you, I mean, you started with, well, when I first read your book and you said you were born with a sense of knowing and that pretty much stopped me in my tracks to go like, okay, how, how does one figure this out? Now, you know, I, I'm also a student, uh, not not as deeply as you are, I'm sure, of Abraham Hicks, and uh, I found them very enlightening um, once I started uh, uh, talking to them and, and well, not talking to them personally, but, you know, reading their, their teachings. Um, and I resonated, I really, really resonated with the majority of it. So when you talk about being born with a sense of knowing, well... <laughs> I mean, you're born pretty young. <laughs> so about when did you figure that out? Well, I think when we are born, we're in our truest state of connection and well-being. And I think it's just the contrast along the way that um, we tend to forget. We tend to forget that we know for ourselves so well. Mm-hmm. But um, I, it was very clear to me from, uh, from my earliest memory. And I believe that if we ask people Mm -hmm. to look back and to remember the first time they really knew for themselves, even though they didn't know how or why, Mm -hmm. that people could could say that, yes, there were so many times where I knew, but I didn't trust myself. So um, I think it's really important that we regain our connection with our inner knowing, our inner being, Mm -hmm. because I think that inner guidance is really our our truest and most accurate path individually for each and every one of us. All right. So in that journey for each individual, I have so many so many things down <laughs> written down here. Um, for you, when, all right. When you when you uh, begin working with someone, what is the first step in in gaining that? alignment or in in figuring out who they are or their sense of knowing for you? Well, first of all, I just ask people, you know, to tell me what, whatever the initial um, situation is, Mm -hmm. because I think that most people understand their situation as their life instead of a moment in their life. And so I help them um, in reminding them that this is just simply a moment. Of maybe contrast, um, this is not your life. This is just one moment in your life. And I think when people understand that, they can take a deep breath and they can understand that there's so many opportunities and identifying whatever this moment is or isn't. Mm-hmm. And then how do, how do we move forward and talk about what we're actually wanting for ourselves? It's interesting because you can ask people all day long what they want, and they'll tell you all day long what they don't want. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I have found and that to be true, even we, with myself. <laughs> yeah, and when we talk so much about what we don't want, we continually get what we don't want. So um, it, it's, I think once we can become aware of our inner conversations that we're having with ourselves all day long, it's really helpful to isolate whatever that unconscious mind chatter is because it's really directing us out of default instead of allowing us to consciously create our life because what we think about is what we attract into our lives. So, you know, simple reminders 
to people about how we can really create more of what we're wanting, I think is helpful. And most people, when you talk about these things, there's something that um, is familiar. Like they get it. They're like, oh, yeah, like this sounds familiar to me. Well, of course it does, because this is your inner knowing. This is your inner being. So it's a pro this process is like moving you like closer to coming home to yourself. And it's a really nice, gentle way of um, helping people help themselves, which I think that is our job. How do we assist people in assisting themselves? Absolutely. Now, I, I wrote a question down here because I was looking uh, through the book and I was reading this. And we have alignment and we have reframing. And we have changing our story. And I'm like, wow, which which comes first? You know, the chicken or the egg and all of this. Um, so our first step, that first step in, in well, number one, you, uh, you talked down here about uh, establishing self-love and loving ourselves uh, for who we are. And most people uh, don't know how to do that. We spend so much time worrying about what other people think. I don't know that so many people are actually in touch of in touch with themselves. And, and, you know, I, from my standpoint, cause a life coach and, and a uh, friend and, and many other things, but, you know, try to um, help people understand that, you know, you, you are perfect. Like you are, even, even if you're kind of messed up, you know, <laughs> because Absolutely. You have to, I you mean, have to accept we're, I think we're all doing fine forward. Right. Yeah. So yeah. what, um, yeah. How, how do we go about, about really um, connecting with that self-love and loving ourselves for who we are? Well, I, I think that the most important relationship we have is the one with ourselves. And that is the foundation for every other relationship that we will ever go on to have. That just hands down is the way it is. So, you know, how can we begin to turn inward there really is nothing outside of us. How can we turn inward and begin to look at ourselves in a loving, compassionate way? And that, that's a big question. And yet there are so many simple ways, even five minutes a day, to begin that process. So, you know, if we are to sit quietly with ourselves in the morning, in the afternoon, whenever, and just take a few moments quietly to just appreciate the moment that really helps us connect to who we are. So it's something so simple. Mm -hmm. And it also sends the message to us that we're important, that we value ourselves, that we are worthy of taking this time to recreate this connection with us. It would be wonderful if we could do this, you know, a few moments every day. Mm -hmm. You know, we, well, most people tend to do is they tend to put others ahead of themselves. The problem with, with that is that then we resent people because we're really giving something we don't have mm -hmm. as opposed to giving to ourselves first. And then from that place of connection, filling over unconditionally in a loving way to others. So what do they say when you get on the airplane to assist your child? You put <laughs> your oxygen mask on first. And if you think about it, mm -hmm. in some ways, it's a little counterintuitive because our reflex would be to assist another. But we have the inner resources within us. If we tap in there and connect, they're definitely there. But until we make that connection, we're not in a wonderful position to be giving mm -hmm. until we have given to ourselves first. So is that selfish? No. I think that that is... Uh, the most wonderful gift that we can bestow on anyone else is to care for ourselves first and then through that connection, extend ourselves to others unconditionally, without condition. And that's really what begins to happen when we engage in a little self-care. Now, the term un un unconditionally, because most of us aren't really familiar with that, Normally, there's a there's a condition connected to everything we do. If we give, we expect something back. If we 
if we uh, accept something, we expect that we need to give something back to them as, as opposed to just accepting. So how, um, how does one learn to give or accept for that matter unconditionally? I think it's a state of being. I don't think it's something that we learn. I think it's something that we are. When we are truly connected to ourselves, Mm -hmm. we are so happy to extend ourselves because we're coming from such a place where we're so full that we, we kind of like spill over and flow into someone else's experience without asking anything in return. And that's the beauty of connection with self. The ego stands down. There's no room for ego when we're connected to ourselves. And the outcome is such that we are so available Mm -hmm. in in our presence with another that it is unconditional. We don't need anything in return. So it is in many ways something that maybe is unfamiliar to us as a term, and yet it's completely familiar to us because this is actually who we are. Mm -hmm. This is who we all are. We just have lost sight of it through moments of disconnection throughout the day. So have you ever been, uh, now you said you were born with your sense of knowing, but I mean, have you lost that connection anywhere, anywhere along the way that you had to, to fight to get it back or, or, you know, to come back into that loving relationship with yourself that, that you tell us that we all need. Um, I guess, you know, have you, have you ever lost your way? I guess is a, is a question here. And how did you get back? Well, I think I, I did lose my way in moments um, when I was in my family of origin, because I kept looking to my mother, mm-hmm. you know, for the connection, even though I was connected to myself, I kept thinking, this is the, person who brought me into this world and and I wanted so much to feel with her what I felt with myself and so it was very confusing for many many years although I knew that there was no way I was going to give up the connection to myself to try to engage her so oftentimes this happens in relationships we'll be with a partner and we'll feel that Maybe um, we're, they're drifting away or somehow we're, we're not communicating as well or somehow the relationship doesn't feel as strong. So we think to ourselves, how can I change myself? How can I become something different so that I can get the approval back from another person? Those are moments of disconnection, if you think about it. And yet... We have those moments actually all day long. We look to the outside for cues to see if we're okay, Mm -hmm. as opposed to looking inward with the knowing that, yes, all is well. We are okay, and we're doing just fine. So it's retraining ourselves to look inward, to explore the inner relationship that we have with ourselves, and not be dependent on the outside world to reflect our best self back to us. And how wonderful when we can actually do that for ourselves. So we reflect our best self back to ourselves. Well, when we start talking about our best self, you know, how, um, I mean, I know a lot of people with different uh, problems, you know, I've, I've had a few you know, back in the day with, with me when I needed to, you know, figure out, as we say, who I was and, and, and whether or not I was happy with me. And I know a lot of people who um, have at least pieces of that. And, you know, we go to different vehicles to fix that. We go to, um, you know, substance abuses. We go to alcohol. Uh, we go to, I mean, we go to any number of things. So when you find yourself. Now, I understand that you're going to say that that's uh, when we're we're at those points that we're actually, we've lost connection with ourselves, but how from that point, from say um, uh, a substance abuse standpoint, do we get back to uh, who we are? And, and, you know, we're we're also looking for, you know, if you're having substance abuse issues, um, how do you stop 
abusing substances, you know, in this okay. alignment process. So, so you're talking about something which I call alignment, mm-hmm. where our thoughts and our feelings are one. And I do not believe that any substance is harmful. Mm-hmm. If we are to engage in substance from a place of already feeling good, the mm-hmm. problem is that we are looking to that substance to make us feel good. And that never works. So the real question is, is how can we find something to feel good about before we engage in a substance and then use that substance as a way to accentuate our already feeling good place? So. For most people who are engaging in substance, and I have clients who do, I would say that's great. Wonderful. Good for you. Now, if you could try to feel good before you engage in that substance, you're going to have a much better time. It's going to feel a whole lot better for you to have a drink from a good feeling place than to have a drink from a place where you're not feeling good because that never works. It it just doesn't. So, when people begin to kind of flip the switch and think about it in a different way, they think of it, then they can begin to think about, okay, what are some of the things that I can think about that will soothe me into connection with myself, that will make me feel better in this moment? Do you do anything with uh, hypnosis or any, anything like that as far as your practice is concerned? No, I don't. But I think that most people are in a state of hypnosis a very good part of the day. <laughs> I think that we're highly highly suggestive if you think about it. Mm-hmm. And I think that we're being brainwashed all day long. So I say, well, if that is happening to us, then why don't we participate in that experience directly and consciously create something for ourselves, engage in our own brainwashing, engage in our own self-hypnosis. And when we're not feeling good for whatever reason, when we're reading the newspaper or we're engaged in political conversations that we know are not feeling good, it's really wonderful way of taking care of yourself to say to yourself, you know, this is not resonating with me. And then to simply excuse yourself. You know, like, that's a great way to take care of yourself. Yeah, the not resonating. I <laughs> I, I don't typically use those that term, per se, but it is correct. I, uh, uh, and, and, yeah, the political climate is getting, you know, it's been really uh, a bit, a lot of turmoil lately, so... Uh, and I know I stopped like from personally, I stopped watching the news as a habit back in like 1989, because most of that stuff didn't apply to me. And, and a lot of it wasn't even true or accurate in, in the first place. So just to have something that was going to bombard me and from an alignment standpoint, to have something that was going to make me feel that way, fearful or anxious. I'm like, you know, it's, let's turn that stuff off. So I pretty much, uh, turned all of that off and which which helped a lot and now of course i started reading things that you know that were more uplifting but um well this is the thing about that this is what i'd like to tell people if you're going to make the choice to watch the news and you know as you're watching it you're not feeling good Mm -hmm. then at least acknowledge it to yourself at least say to yourself i know what i'm watching is not making me feel good and i'm choosing to do it anyway That way you're not a victim to the news. You're not a victim to anything. You're consciously making a choice. And that's very empowering because when we take personal responsibility for our actions, Mm -hmm. then it's very empowering. So whatever you're choosing to do, at least there's no good or bad choice. It's just a choice. It's a moment. At least acknowledge that it is your choice. Because I think a lot of people feel victim to everything. And that's just not true. We really aren't victim to anything. When we are consciously choosing to either engage in something passively or actively or not. That's a choice. That's powerful and very freeing. It is. It is. Now, we talk here about... uh taking responsibility for our lives, which you just sort of kind of discussed this, but 
You also talk a lot in your book about changing your story in order to, or, or I don't know, you know, reframing and changing your story, I guess they prob- probably go hand in hand. Um, so when you feel victim, I'll say when you feel the victim, um, and we've seen a lot of stuff where people kind of, kind of need their story. <laughs> and we, we fight hard sometimes to keep our stories so we can get whatever we get from it. But can you give us an example or a process for uh, number one, recognizing that we have a problem with our story and being able to change that story to something that we can then um, be in alignment with so we can make things better. Okay. So our story is really what we tell ourselves and others over and over and over. And it is like our mantra. And most of the time we're unaware of how we feel about our story, even as we are incessantly repeating it. Mm -hmm. So I ask people, you know, is your story working for you? And how do you feel when you're telling your story? Does it feel good? And if it does, then keep telling that story because the life that you're living is a direct reflection of that story that you're telling and it's all working well for you. However, if your story does not feel good to you when you're telling it, then it probably doesn't feel good to you as you're living it. I mean, that's a huge revelation. So just to understand for a you know, a person to take responsibility and be like, oh my God, like I tell the story a thousand times today and no, it doesn't feel good. Well, okay. Because you can change any part of that story in a moment's notice. Truly. On the other hand, nobody's going to take that story away from you. So if, if, if this story is, has so much drama and, and, <laughs> so much trauma in it Mm. that it's getting you the attention that you are needing. Okay. That's all good. Clearly that component is working for you. What we think about is what we attract into our lives. So if you are choosing to change your thoughts, even three lines of your story, you will create a better feeling life experience. Sometimes it's just changing a few words. However, Mm -hmm. once again, I think we're all doing fine. And we really are. You know, I think if we want to feel better, there are so many wonderful ways to do it. You know, contrast is a beautiful thing. And we're experiencing a ton of contrast now in this political climate. Mm -hmm. However, as a result of contrast, I see unbelievable change occurring and it's very exciting it is so so contrast you know is is the jumping off point for desire give us uh, i'm sorry give us a little uh, now for for some people who particularly aren't familiar with the teachings of of abraham hicks just talk a little bit about contrast if you would well contrast is really anything other than what we're wanting in this moment so You know, I see contrast is endless opportunity because once you know what you don't want, you begin to know what you do want, and then you can start moving towards that. So sometimes we need a little contrast in order to identify our desires. So anytime throughout my day, I'm experiencing a little contrast, I get really excited because from that moment, I have a wonderful opportunity to focus on a new desire. And then over time, you begin to train yourself to look in the direction that you're wanting to go because it becomes so very clear. So what we don't want allows us to see very clearly what we do want. And if we focus on what we do want, well, we get there very quickly. We are brilliant, deliberate creators. It really is all about focusing our thoughts and coming into alignment with our thoughts and our feelings. And that's what manifestation is. Mm -hmm. And we really do it all day long, good and bad. We manifest things all day long that we don't want because we think about what we don't want. Flip the switch, you know, flip the script. 
<laughs> Begin to manifest things that you do want. Train your mind to focus on what you want, and you will have what you want. So how would you now, in, in changing the contrast, well, actually, you're not changing the contrast. You're just focusing on the other side of that. How, how do you, uh, when you take someone who, uh, I don't know, a, a brief example, who, uh, you know, let's take something about, you know, no, nobody likes me. I know a lot of people, who, you know, I'm I'm not smart. Nobody likes me. Um, they've, they've never liked me. Uh, and, and help That's an them, old story. Help, help That's them a really change. old story. It, it, it well, is. first of all, it, you know, it, it's really um, helpful when you ask people to look at what they're saying and ask them if it is relevant to their now. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of people talk about things for years and years and years and years and years that they thought happened to them when they were younger. If you're able to take that and look at it from your now adult perspective, you really begin to change the conversation because you can see it through your now perspective. So I ask people all the time, just whatever it is that you're feeling, and usually it's an exaggerated feeling, mm -hmm. does that fit into your now? And when people are able to stop and think about it, they understand, no, it's not. So that's old stuff. That's vibrational residue. That's stuff that you carried for 10 years into your now unnecessarily because there's really no place for it. It's a habit. It's a habit of thought that then you allow people to let go of it or to replace it with a conversation that is reflective of their now. And that's going to be the direction you want to go and not the direction where you think you have to go. Um, yes. All right. Let me see here. Um, I have down here about, and you probably repeat something that you said about taking responsibility for our lives and giving up our victim status. I'm a huge, um, we'll call it a student of people's victim status. Um, and it's not always easy not being the victim anymore. It's not easy giving that up. So if you had a short prescription, well, I, I, is there a short prescription? I mean, you say in your book, you can change your story. Like I can't snap my fingers like that. Um, the story that I've told in the past for me, hasn't been that simple. Uh, I mean, I've, I've worked it out over uh, years, um, or sometimes months to, to change that story and, and grow into the, to the story I wanted versus uh, the story I had been telling, but it's, it's not always that easy for people. So what is, I mean, how, how, how does one do that? And I hope I'm not being. Redundant. Okay. So first of all, personal responsibility is tough for people on one hand. On the other hand, it's very empowering. It really is because, you know, we, we get to choose what we want our life to look like and what we want our life to feel like. And if somebody years ago told us otherwise, well, that was then, but this is now. And so we can begin a new conversation with ourselves about the way we want our lives to look and the way we want our lives to feel. And by simply having that conversation with ourselves, we are creating the new story. It's our story. We're responsible for it. And we get to put in the content that we are choosing. In every single moment, you can make a different choice about what do you want it to look like? How do you want it to feel? And when you can engage people in that process, it feels really good. 
people get really hooked on this. Then the next cool thing that happens is once they begin having this new conversation with themselves about the new story and their new life, they begin to step into that as their life. It's brilliant. And they own it all. They've done it 100% themselves. Their story, their content, their creation. Mm -hmm. Total self-empowerment. I I developed a, a phrase uh, not too long ago. Well, a couple of years ago at this point, I guess. Uh, that there's nothing wrong in my life that's not my fault. And uh, I, I've I've had arguments with that. People are like, well, how can you say that? You know. And I went, you know what? Because for me, I accepted that if I, if I was on a street corner, for instance, and 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 a guy ran around, you know, someone ran around a corner and. Uh, with a car and, and collided with me, let's 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 hope they didn't kill me. <laughs> well, I wouldn't be here for the story. But I'm like, you know, if if I hadn't chosen that street corner at that time, that that incident couldn't have happened. Uh, and I've been listening to a lot of stuff recently. Uh, I don't know if you know Grant Cardone, uh, but they talk. No. You know, he has another book that talks about. You know, taking responsibility for for your life, even the stuff that, quote unquote, is not your fault. Allows you to take responsibility for everything, because then you start to do things which help to direct that. So this part of uh, changing your story and deciding that you are responsible for whatever happens in your life. Gives a new perspective in that, well, I actually have to do something to make sure that happens, I think. Um, it, is, well, am I sounding correct? The third, yes, but the first thing you have to do is just think about it. Nobody can do that for you. No one can think about what you want for your life, how you want it to look, how you want it to feel. That's taking personal responsibility to think about how you want your life to look. It's like a, a gift. It's like the universe giving you a gift and saying to you, no matter what your current situation is, what would you like your life to be like? What would you like it to look like? How would you like it to feel? Engage in that possibility. And when people start to do that, Mm -hmm. they literally step into a totally different story. So these are just small things that we can do for ourselves and we can only do them for ourselves. Nobody can do this for us. You know, we can blame our parents. We can blame our teachers. You can blame the government. You can blame anybody. You can use a a zillion different people as an excuse not to feel good and why your life isn't what you want it to be. Or you can use those same people as your very excuse to have the most amazing life. Because you look at the contrast and you go, this is what I don't want. And now I know what I do want. I'm going to create that for me. Powerful stuff. It is powerful stuff. Now you tell us that in your book that you are in or are, and on your website that you are in your, your third life now. <laughs> I was like, I, like I am on my third life. life. <laughs> she's only been here once. So tell us a little bit about that. <laughs> well, the- <laughs> well, you know, I, I have three, I have, I have, um, I co-created a beautiful family with my husband. I have three grown children and um, I had this thriving practice and now I have another practice. I have three grandchildren now. And I really feel like I am on my third life. And the other thing I believe is that we're really here to have joy. I think our life is really all about joy. And I think that if we laugh more, Mm -hmm. laughter is a great way for us to connect with ourselves and to connect with other people. Laughter is like a universal language. You could go anywhere in the world and laugh and people understand that, you know, laughter connects us to ourselves and to other people. And I just think we take it all too seriously. And there are so many ways to appreciate where we are in this moment And then to further create something more wonderful for ourselves. Once again, we cannot create for other people. We are not responsible for creating for other people, and we cannot do it. And when we think we can, that's ego. 
And that's just not true. But we can create for ourselves. And then once we create this amazing life, then we come to in, become the inspiration for other people to do it as well. So, you know, we just need to take a breath and to make some decisions about what we want. Most people just, they don't even want to go there. But mm-hmm. until you do that, you know, you know, you're stuck in a moment, which is okay. And you know what? Sometimes it's okay to be stuck as long as you acknowledge you're choosing to be stuck. Then you could be stuck all day long. Acknowledge it as a choice. Because it only takes a moment to make a shift to a better feeling place, to get out of being stuck. I'm sorry, to get out of? Feeling stuck. Oh, yes. So it only takes a moment. You know, it only takes a moment to shift your thinking into a better feeling thought. So that you're not stuck in this moment. And then the next moment and the next moment and the next moment. And that's really what life is. It's just a series of moments. I also do not believe that there are any consequences. I believe that there are outcomes. We make a decision. It isn't what we thought it would be. It's not something we're happy about. It's an outcome. So next time we make a different kind of decision. But none of it's a big deal. (laughs) It really isn't. It's really not. It's a moment. And on to the next moment, moving right along, getting on your merry way, moving forward. All right. I know this is going to be, um, and and I kind of know what you're going to say, but I need for you to say it and not me. Um, A lot of times we do things, uh, and I I stop for the most part, (laughs) for, you know, making someone else happy, to make someone else feel better. Um, to make someone else like us, uh, you know, that, that kind of thing. What is your advice on, I guess that's, uh, pleasing others. Well, I think that with those decisions that we make comes resentment. If we're not doing it, for ourselves, it doesn't work. However, if we're making a conscious choice that to do something for someone else would make us feel good, I think that's a recipe for success. It's a win-win. So if someone asks me to do something and in their asking, it doesn't exactly resonate with me, Mm -hmm. I might take a few moments and reframe that situation for myself so that I can feel good about it. If I can do that, then I am happy to extend myself Mm -hmm. in this way for another. If I'm not, then I must say, I'm sorry, I'm unable to to do X, Y, and Z at this time. That's being true to myself. And that's also really being true to the other person. Because do you want someone that's just going to go through the motions? Or do you want someone that genuinely is going to Um, respond to you in a way that is real. Excellent. Mm -hmm. All right. Reframing. Now, you know, reframing is an art, I think. It's Uh, a practice. That's for sure. (laughs) (laughs) So excellent. Well, I think I've hit all my, I think I've hit all my pieces here. Um, We're going to create connections with our inner being. You've talked about doing that. I mean, if you've got some more on that, because, you know, I, you know, I feel very fortunate. I, I, some of the stuff that I've been through, I'm I'm in a pretty good place right now. I, um, I have no envy. I have no jealousy per se. I'm, I'm like, you know, I, I, I like who I am as a, as a human and I like you know, helping other people to the extent that I can. Sometimes I get tired and like, well, you know what? I can't do that anymore because I need a a refill. Uh, So I consider myself to be in a pretty good spot and helping other people get in a similar spot is kind of what I'm all about. It's my whole intensely positive, um, intensely positive approach to things. And because I tell people, you know, positively, I mean, it's not just it's not just talking. It's not a, it's not a weird phrase, uh, uh, a turn of phrase. It, it, it's actually action. You're doing things intentionally and you are creating that 
attitude and that circumstance and so forth. So um, on on that note, you were, I mean, perfect for the show because you're all about talking about creating the life that you want. And, you know, nobody had to run up a mountain to do it or jump off or <laughs> we just had to get in touch with our inner selves and the person who was really us. So I'd kind of like, if you had one, one piece of advice that you would give everyone about how to live the life they want to. And I was going to say change your life or whatever that is. It, it all boils down to living the life they want to live. What would be your keystone piece of advice here? Trust yourself. Even though you don't know why you know or how you know, trust yourself because you know. You know for yourself. You do know. I have never heard from anyone. I've never heard them say, why did I listen to myself? Mostly I hear people say, why didn't I listen to myself? Our inner being is on call 24-7. It is our guiding light. Trust yourself. It is tapping you on the shoulder all day long. And most of us are just pushing it away because we can't be bothered. But our inner voice in every single person is there to guide you. Listen for it and trust yourself. And it doesn't matter how or why you know, you know. You always know for yourself. Always. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for <laughs> thank you. On the show here. Now we got to tell everybody where you are, and your website okay. is jamielearner. Excuse me, j a m i e dash l e r n e r dot com. An integrative approach to well being, and there's lots of good information on that site as well as how to get in touch with Jamie. Is there anything you'd like to tell us about your, your practice, Jamie, uh, other, other than what you've said so far uh, that uh, can help entice people to, to go visit you and learn more about you? Um, the website has a lot of free resources. So if you're interested, please check it out. It's cool. I also have a new um, lovely texting option called the Quickie which has really been a great resource for clients because um, you purchase texting time. And really what it does, is it helps people um, check back in with themselves via texting with me. So I love that new service. Um, and mostly I would say if you are able to check out the book, it is a very short, very easy book for people to read and has a lot of tools in it that are explained in very simple language. Um, so I encourage you to just check it out because it's, it's a, it's a, I think it's a, a good resource for people. So yeah. uh, that's it. And I will make sure we have that in the show notes. And I just, I'm just reading it. The name of the book again is, the ever-loving essence of you create a long-term connected relationship with yourself. Jamie Leonard and Lauren Targ. I have first time I've actually said that name. Available on Amazon. Yeah, yeah and, it is. And you know, take a highlighter with you when you go read it. There's a lot of stuff. To, there's a lot of stuff to think about. Thank you so much, Jamie. Thank you very much. You have an awesome day. You too. Bye bye. Bye. Wow, that was awesome.